Tonight, making contact, a Victorian COVID tracing team arrives in Sydney to study how New South Wales is doing it better. But the Premier is standing firm on the curfew as today's case numbers drop below 50. It's beginning to feel not like Christmas, a warning about supermarket supplies, and Maya cancels its famed window display. A $50 million cash splash for tourism, but operators say they'll need the borders open to make it work. America's growing wildfire disaster, children among the victims as entire towns disappear in flames. And the battle for big stakes as the cats and the tigers prepare for a Friday night blockbuster. This is 10 News First Melbourne with Jennifer Cutt. Good evening. First, the Premier has doubled down on Melbourne's strict curfew amid criticism over who ordered it. It comes as a team from Victoria begins work in Sydney to learn how we can improve our contact tracing and gain control of the virus. Sent interstate to learn. Welcome to New South Wales. The team from Victoria will be told how to improve our contact tracing. They were even able to skip quarantine due to the urgency of the task. Today, Victoria recorded 43 new cases and nine deaths. 140 people are in hospital, 12 of those are in ICU, and eight of them are on ventilators. The trajectory is in the right direction, I think. We would all like it to be a little bit quicker. And despite heavy criticism, the Premier is steadfast on keeping Melbourne's curfew in place. And let me be really clear with you, the curfew position at the moment will not be changing because it is working. He promises extra business support is imminent. And we'll make announcements quite soon and they will be very, very substantial. Uh, I can't promise that they'll be everything that everyone wants in terms of the, you know, the finer detail, but it will be a massive package of important uh, support. But for many, it will be too late. New data shows the pandemic's presence is scaring people away from going to hospital for serious health conditions. Visits to emergency departments have dropped by 25%, heart attack presentations are down by 18%, and strokes 24%. Reporting of the five most common cancers is down by a third. If you have uh, symptoms of concern, uh, it is important that you continue to seek that medical care. It may, in fact, save your life. Jodie Ryan had a heart attack last week, but initially thought it was anxiety. She almost died. Up if I didn't go call the ambulance when I did, chances are I would have not woken up. A timely reminder that nothing is quite as important as your health. Candace Wyatt joins us live now. Candace, anti-lockdown protesters are planning to take their frustration to the streets again tomorrow. They are indeed, Jen, if you can believe it. Despite those crazy scenes we saw last weekend and 17 arrests, they're planning on doing it all over again. It's called the Melbourne Walk for Freedom. And so far, more than 1,000 people have indicated via Facebook that they're interested in attending. Now, when the Premier was asked about this rally today, he called it selfish. And Victoria Police is more than aware of the plans. And you can expect to see a heavy police presence down here at the TAN and also in the city. Now, one of the organisers of that protest had his house raided before he turned himself into police. He believes the numbers of COVID-19 are being widely exaggerated and that it is a manufactured virus designed to affect the weak. Now, he is already facing charges arising from a previous protest, but he's faced court today, charged with, among other things, breaching bail. And, Jen, just a short time ago, a magistrate allowed him to to walk free. Thank you very much, Candice. Daniel Andrews has rejected leaked polling, which shows that growing voter anger over the lockdowns would lead to Labor losing key seats at an election. State political reporter Simon Love has more. Leaked media reach polling commissioned by the Liberal Party shows that voters may be turning on Daniel Andrews in the wake of his government's numerous failings on coronavirus. 
The polling in five key seats shows that Labor would take a huge hit if an election were held today. At the 2018 election, Labor won 53% of the two-party preferred vote. The polls show that if a vote was to occur now, a 14% swing would see the Liberals have more than 60% of the share. The pollsters called more than 3,000 people just days after the restriction roadmap was released. Now, those voters were in five key seats, including Deputy Premier James Molino's electorate of Monbolk. This is not a popularity contest. This is a global pandemic. I don't think politics and doing what's, what's popular is, uh, is, is what we need to do. We need to do what is right. And that's the leadership that I offer. So I've got no comment to make on that. Victorians are speaking with a very strong voice. They are over this Premier. They are over the lack of hope, the lack of a roadmap out of here. They are over his onerous lockdowns. I understand both sides of politics have planning well underway for the 2022 election, but it's anyone's guess as to how the coronavirus crisis will play out in voters' minds in two years' time. Simon Love reporting. Well, the Food and Grocery Council has moved to allay fears produce could be in short supply at Christmas because of restrictions. The Premier says they're still working out how to ensure supermarket shelves are full while keeping limits on distribution warehouses. There's always a mad dash to the shops at Christmas, but fears of empty shelves this December have some shoppers on edge. Well, we may not be experiencing the shortages today and we may not be experiencing them next week. Come Christmas, it may be a different story. Others say plenty can change more than three months out. It's probably a little bit of hype. We'll ride it out. The industry says there will be no food shortages. We're pretty confident that manufacturing uh, both in Victoria but also elsewhere in Australia will make sure that there's plenty of product on the supermarket shelves. But we might have to go to multiple stores for the products we want. Woolworth says that will happen if restrictions on distribution centres and warehouses aren't lifted. The Premier insists they're still working it out. It's not going to be a normal Christmas, uh, but we want it to be, we don't want it to be a lockdown Christmas. We want won't be able to see one of our much-loved Melbourne institutions, with Myers Burke Street Mall Christmas window display cancelled for the first time in more than 60 years. It's a really sad day. Obviously, we're going to invest a lot in lots of events uh, over the Christmas period to get people back into the city, but very sad to see that we won't have the My Christmas windows being part of that. Those events are expected to have limited numbers or be virtual, and that's likely to be the case too with the traditional photo with Santa, while other festive fun has been silenced by the pandemic. Some local councils have already made the tough call to move their carols by candlelight online. My five-year-old loves to sing songs, so we'll, we'll sit, still sit there with a candle in our uh, house and sing the songs along as they come on. At this point, we're all desperate for a bit of Christmas cheer. Annie Kearney for 10 News First. The federal government has promised to hand out $50 million in grants to the business events sector. But the bid to reboot the tourism industry hinges on our borders reopening. It's a drop in the ocean for the country's business events sector. $50 million has been allocated by the federal government to try and help save tourism and hospitality jobs. For exhibitions and conferences to be planned and to take place with some certainty and some financial underpinnings. The proposal would allow grants to help pay for exhibition venues and displays, as well as travel and accommodation. There are a whole raft of different jobs that depend on the meetings and conferences sector uh, and we want to help that to get back on its feet. There's hopes events will restart in 2021. The announcement has been welcomed by the Accommodation Association. It's about recognising the need for confidence in getting people back into business events across Australia. In comparison to other funding announcements, $50 million is a conservative amount for the Morrison government. It will be distributed through grants and businesses right across Australia are being encouraged to apply. But this plan is reliant on board is reopening as soon as possible and there's no sign of that happening anytime soon. The more open a state is, uh, the better the opportunity for them to viably conduct a conference or an exhibition 
is going to be. The 50 million is actually pretty good. It's the premiers that are letting us down. New research out today shows domestic tourism grew by $1 billion in June, with the majority of people hitting the regions within their own states. But border closures have brought the aviation sector to its knees. Tiger Airways has become another victim of the pandemic, with the budget carrier officially shutting down. The border closures create ongoing pressures on the viability of those airlines and threaten jobs across those different sectors. Stella Todorovic for 10 News First. Rio Tinto's CEO and two other top executives have resigned over the blast scandal that destroyed ancient Aboriginal heritage sites in WA. The miners' share price also took a hit as investors sent a clear message to the company's board. After months of intense public pressure, heads have finally rolled at the top of Rio Tinto. As we've said from the very beginning, uh, it was very unfortunate this took place and uh, obviously uh, these caves and this history cannot be replaced. The mining giant has been under fire since destroying ancient Aboriginal heritage sites in Jukin Gorge in May. The Pilbara rock shelters held evidence of human occupation dating back at least 46,000 years. The blast was legally sanctioned but went against the wishes of the land's traditional owners. Uh, but I suspect the shareholders will be demanding to see lessons that have been learned. Today, the company announced a major reshuffle. Rio Tinto's chief executive, John Sebastian Jacks, head of Iron Ore, Chris Salisbury, and head of corporate relations, Simone Niven, will step down. In a statement, Rio Tinto said, What happened at Jukin was wrong and we'll ensure it never happens again at a Rio Tinto operation, and we are determined to regain the trust of the traditional landowners. The PKKP people says its focus continues to be on preserving Aboriginal heritage and stopping tragedies like this ever occurring again. It's a broader message of corporate governance that no doubt corporate Australia is learning from uh, and watching. Uh, not with glee, I would say, but watching and learning uh, about what uh, their own boards perhaps reflect. WA's Aboriginal Affairs Minister says he hopes future boards can hold Indigenous representation. A federal parliamentary inquiry into the need for stronger legal protections for similar sites is due to report back in December. Bo Pearson for 10 News First. Well, now here's Stephen with some crucial details about this year's grand final at the Gabba. Yes, Jen, we knew it was going to be a night grand final. Now the AFL has officially announced that kickoff will be 7.30 p.m. Melbourne Daylight Saving Time. That's 6.30 in Queensland on Saturday, October 24. The league says that will provide an optimum time for fans. Plenty of footy coming up in sport as the Giants get tough. Dropping Stephen Cornelio with Toby Green, hoping to provide the punch as stand-in skipper. Thanks, Stephen. Coming up in 10 News First, a family's plea for help after Japan suspends its search for a sunken cattle ship. And from the Avengers to Game of Thrones, tributes flow following the death of veteran TV actor Diana Reek. A stabbing victim has been fined for breaching COVID restrictions after being assaulted at a West Melbourne property early this morning. She was inside the Peel Street house when the 33-year-old man is alleged to have attacked her. The woman was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries as police took the man into custody. Five people were inside the house at the time of the assault. All of them, including the victim, have been fined for breaching the chief health officer's orders. A police officer and his canine companion are both recovering from injuries overnight after their vehicle rolled down an embankment at Buller. It's believed the car veered off Lomans Road about 7.30 last night, but what caused the crash is still not clear. When the first couple of police members arrived, they uh, obviously gave comfort first aid to the policeman, but one of the things that they mentioned was the... Uh, the, uh, the member's dog was uh, by his side um, and they described it as being fairly, fairly emotive that uh, the dog was uh, sitting by his mate looking after him. The sergeant was flown to the Alfred Hospital while the dog was taken to a vet for facial surgery. Families of two young Aussies lost at sea have begged Japanese authorities not to give up the search for their missing ship. The last known position of Gulf Livestock One was off the coast of Japan when it sent a distress call. With seawater flooding the engine room... Really safe. Really, really safe. We 
Julia Mainprize tried to make light of a terrifying situation. Stuck in a typhoon on a cattle ship, Will sent these videos to his mate Harry just hours before it capsized. He's aware, he's up and, you know, he's the toughest person I know and if anyone can get through it, it's Will. He should know. Two months ago, the pair was on a similar ship. Will, an animal lover, was working as the stock welfare officer. Among his last texts to Harry, engine is off and we are floating sideways in huge seas. He was scared, but he was up and ready to go. But nine days on, loved ones of Will and fellow missing Aussie vet Lucas Order have been dealt another cruel blow, with the search all but called off. We are speaking with our hearts in our hands. We beg you not to stop looking for Lucas and the other people missing at sea. A survivor picked up by the Japanese Coast Guard has confirmed the crew was prepared. Before the accident happened, everyone was wearing life vests. The captain called everyone to go to the bridge to enter the lifeboats. They're pleading with the Australian government to help. Importantly, no bodies have been found, even though cow carcasses have been sighted. There's four lifeboats uh, still uh, unaccounted for out there and people can live for up to 30 days on a lifeboat. And that's why they're appealing to all neighbouring nations to commence a large-scale search to US naval bases in the area that has drone technology that could assist. Will has the strongest fighting spirit and we need to have that as well. I'm very confident that he's on a raft and we need to keep searching so we can try and find them. Please help us bring them all home. Please. Thank you. Ali Donaldson for 10 News First. Well, let's take a look at the traffic now. Jess Miller is in the chopper. Thanks, Jen. Taking a flight over Box Hill South in the Carbone Lawyers traffic chopper. This is the intersection of Middleborough Road and Canterbury Road. We were seeing huge delays through here earlier due to a bike incident. All of that congestion has now eased off and most of the emergency services have left the scene. Looks like just a few police chatting to witnesses now. So no hold-ups if you need to travel through here. Uh, also, just have word of a smash on the Monash Freeway city bound before the tunnel. So we'll fly over there and have a look for you. Jen? Thank you, Jess. And ahead in 10 News First, America's catastrophic wildfires claim more lives, thousands of homes, even entire communities. And another fireball in Lebanon sends a shudder through an already shattered city. And shortly I get to say for the final time, it's Friday, it's 5.30, time to give it all go home. And we talk weather. If you've been injured at work, on the road or in a public place, now's the time to act. Carbone Lawyers are open and here to take care of you no matter the situation. Call Carbone Lawyers on 1800 369 888 today. There have been at least nine more deaths in the US as wildfires continue to rage across three West Coast states. Millions of people have been forced to flee their homes as authorities brace for the worst. Escaping what looks like a scene from hell. This driver made it out with just seconds to spare, but others weren't so lucky. There were nine new deaths from the wildfires overnight, four in California, four in Oregon, and the most heartbreaking of all, this beautiful one-year-old in Washington state. It, it makes you think of, you know, where, where would I be if, you know, if this was my child? Tragically, there will be more. This could be the greatest loss of human lives and property due to wildfire in our state's history. Flames stretch endlessly into the night sky. Already exhausted, despondent fireys at times could only stand and watch, powerless to halt the inferno. Holy. Others had more success. We made a stand here for these three homes, which would have probably lit off the whole neighbourhood. One neighbourhood saved, but so many others left in smouldering ruins. This community in Phoenix, Oregon, was levelled, with absolutely nothing left. All the hard work that my parents put into this place, gone. 89-year-old Beth Hill is also homeless after her aged care facility was destroyed. The centre has burned with all of our things. Everything I own is there. Not only me, but everybody else. But it's not just possessions people have lost. I just want to know where the rest of my family is. Fortunately, Brenda Hampton has her granddaughter. I played it. 
for California this year has been particularly devastating. Residents repeatedly forced to leave their homes, with the state being torched by six of the largest fires in its history. A couple cars came up with their blue lights and their weird sirens, and they just said everybody out. And while San Francisco has been spared, there's no missing one of the worst wildfire seasons in American history. Dom Halen for 10 News First. Beirut is again shrouded in thick black smoke after a massive fire broke out at the city's port overnight. Flames ripped through the rubble left by last month's huge explosion, which killed almost 200 people and injured thousands more. It's believed this blaze started at a warehouse where oil and tyres are stored. No injuries have been reported. Donald Trump was back on the campaign trail today, this time visiting supporters in the swing state of Michigan. But he was again forced to defend comments he made to a journalist earlier this year about the seriousness of the coronavirus as it took hold in the U.S. This whack job that wrote the book, he said, well, Trump knew a little bit. They wanted me to come out and scream, people are dying, we're dying. No, no, we did it just the right way. We have to be calm. We don't want to be crazed lunatics. Democrats have seized on the revelations. Vice President candidate Kamala Harris slamming Donald Trump for having reckless disregard for lives. Well, protesters have again targeted the statue of former British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill in London. The wartime leader was branded a racist in bright yellow spray paint. It followed 10 days of demonstrations by the Extinction Rebellion, which included almost 650 arrests, one of those for the graffiti on the Churchill statue. And now here's Mike with a look ahead to the weather. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Good evening, as expected. A sunny start to a fairly cloudy afternoon. Fairly windy also, with rain on the agenda over the weekend. 11 the overnight low, around 20 degrees this afternoon. And tonight, we're at the Lost Dogs Home in North Melbourne, a relationship forged some 15 years ago. And, yeah, all those years back, I came up with this catchphrase. Staff? It's Friday. It's Friday. It's 5.30. It's time Friday. to give a dog a home. Big dogs and small dogs, old dogs and young dogs all getting a second chance at a happy life, around 600. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who have rescued these dogs. But it doesn't always go to plan, especially working with cats. And then for the all-important weekend, it will be cooler, it'll be cloudy, maybe some spots of rain. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is one-year-old Banjul, a beautiful beagle. Wants to go to your place. Of course, all the details at dogshome.com. Got the forecast in full at 5.55 plus 6.25. And that's what I'll be saying farewell. Jen. Always loved that segment. Thank you, Mike. Still to come, we'll have the day's finance. And move over master as Australia's rodeo capital welcomes racing's greatest prize. Good evening. Citigroup has made Wall Street history today. It's named Jane Fraser as its next CEO. She'll be the first female to lead a global bank. Fraser's a 16-year veteran of the bank and she'll now lead Citi's efforts to manage the economic fallout from the pandemic. In the most recent quarter, Citi's profits plunged 73% and it was forced to set aside more than $7 billion to cover potential losses. Now, executives at Metcash, the wholesaler that keeps IGA's shelves full of groceries, is worried about what Victoria's continued lockdown will mean for Christmas, saying it'll be very difficult to cater for the festive season's increase in demand and that it's hard to catch up, let alone to get in front, particularly for regional areas. IGA has joined Woolworth's call for supermarket chains to be allowed to operate at full capacity and not just the two-third limit that's currently in place. Now, today, all eyes were on Rio stocks after news its chief executive, Jean-Sebastien Jacques, will exit the company alongside two other execs linked to the destruction of an ancient Aboriginal site in May. In response to the move, the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility said shareholder democracy and investor action is alive and well in Australia. So let's take a look at the markets. The ASX finished in the red. Now that's the fourth straight weekly loss. Now Rigo took a small hit, but that was expected given it was investors pushing for accountability. And the Australian dollar is buying just under 73 US cents. Antoinette Latouf reporting there. 
Well, she was the only Bond girl to make an honest man of 007. And she rocked a leather pantsuit on the Avengers. Dame Diana Rigg has died aged 82, but was winning new fans right to the end. Dame Diana Rigg knew how to make a first impression. This was her debut appearance as Emma Peel on The Avengers, a sexy, confident, witty woman who drove fans wild. That was very, very dirty. And she was just as confident off screen, becoming one of the first women to complain about the lack of equal pay. When I stepped forward and said, I think it's quite wrong that I'm getting less than the cameraman. And of course, then I was painted as this, this sort of mercenary woman and hard headed and, you know, money grabbing and all the rest of it. But it struck me as being unfair, so I spoke out. Diana Rigg was also a Bond girl, the only one to get the super spy, played by Australia's George Lazenby, to the altar. Spoiler alert. The marriage didn't last. It's a quite, quite a good trick because it means that he has all the right um, uh, motives deep down underneath. In other words, he is prepared to get married if he loves the girl. But then by some terrible trick of fate, she's taken away from him and he's suddenly available for all those females again. Rig continued to shine on stage and screen, winning a BAFTA, a Tony and an Emmy. And she won a new generation of fans when she starred in Game of Thrones. I did unspeakable things to protect my family or watch them being done on my orders. I never lost a night's sleep over them. They were necessary. Rig was diagnosed with cancer in March and died peacefully at home. She was 82. Angela Bishop for 10 News First. The Melbourne Cup is doing a whistle-stop tour of regional Queensland as part of a national tour, but this year things are a little different. Today, our most recognisable trophy paid a virtual visit to Gympie, home to a couple of racing legends. The 2019 Melbourne Cup, Bob Leach can still hear the call of that last 200 metres. With Bow and Declare on the inside, then Prince of Aaron Raymond, Tusk Finch. The, the goosebumps, um, it happens when you start talking about the Melbourne Cup, it, it just comes up over the back of your neck. And that photo finish that reduced these two blokes to blubbering babies. Bow and Declare kicks, Bow and Declare's won it for Australia, they're on top of the world. We're a part of it, and not only a part of it, but he's won it. Like any adrenaline rush, Bob, Gimpy's deputy mayor, and Anthony, the town's high school principal, wanted more. And today they got it when the Melbourne Cup had a virtual visit to Gimpy High School as part of a 27 destination national tour. There's all sorts of emotions, like you're laughing, you're crying, you're swearing. There's a <laughs> fair bit of swearing. The Cup has also journeyed a lot further west, taking in some of the must-see attractions of Longreach. Just a tonic for a region doing it tough. We're in six years of drought here, um, so we've been through some pretty tough times. But just having the cup here and just, you know, showcasing it in our community just allows everyone to see it and just forget about that for a little while and just, just have a bit of fun. The Cup's virtual tour ahead of that Tuesday in November will also include many of the bushfire affected towns of New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. In a photo finish, a classic cup. Go you good thing. Tim Collins for 10 News First. Well, Jess Miller's in the traffic chopper. Let's get an update on our roads. Thank you, Jen. Over Brighton in the Carbo Lawyers traffic chopper. Look, we heard crowds were gathering along the Esplanade near Dendy Street, so we thought we'd fly over to see what was going on. And sure enough, we spotted an Australian television legend, Mike Larkin, and his crew at Brighton Beach. So if you're travelling through here anytime soon, make sure you beep your horn and make lots of noise for Mike Larkin. Back soon with more actual traffic, Jen. Great report. Thank you, Jess. Well, now here's Stephen with Friday Sport and a massive game tonight on the Gold Coast. Uh, sure is, Jen. It's the heavy hitters. The Cats against the Tigers will cross live for a preview. Also, the Giants drop their skipper. A star demon out for the year. The Saints send out an SOS. And so long, Serena, beaten in three sets in the US Open Senate. If you've been injured at work, on the road or in a public place, now's the time to act. Carbone Lawyers are open and here to take care of you no matter the situation. Call Carbone Lawyers on 1800 369 888 today. 
Good evening. It's looming as one of the games of the season with the Cats and Tigers doing battle on the Gold Coast tonight. Tim Morgan is there. Tim, will the teams try and keep their powder dry ahead of the finals? Good evening, Stephen. No, I spoke to both camps this afternoon. They're certainly not holding anything back. This will be a full dress rehearsal, one final thorough examination before the final series. It's a pretty important clash for both teams too. Geelong still in the top two hunt. As for Richmond, well, it is expected they need to win out if they are to earn the double chance. So we haven't seen these two teams play each other since last year's preliminary final. We all know how that went with Richmond winning on their way to obviously the Premiership. Geelong, in fact, has lost four of its last five against the Tigers, but they do feel they're better placed in 2020 to get over the line against the Tigers. Yeah, well, they've just been the best team in the competition for, for a number of years, and we've been a little bit behind them. Everyone knows how they play, but stopping it is another thing. So hopefully we've made some gains on last year and looking forward to the challenge. Now, there is certainly one big difference tonight to uh, last year's preliminary final. That is the fact that Tom Hawkins is playing and he is in incredible form. So certainly a big job for Noah Bolter and co down in defence for the Tigers, but they're still confident they can uh, stop the influence of the Coleman medal leader. Yeah, he's not bad at footy, that guy, is he? Uh, having some sort of purple patch. But, uh, look, he's been a good player for, for a long time. And I think what Geelong have done so well this year has been able to isolate him in a lot of 1v1 contests and he's incredibly hard to stop. So um, we've got some things in place that hopefully we can c combat that. So just to finish, Stephen, some news that might directly impact these two teams. We have a time for the first ever night grand final. It's going to be 6.30 on the ground up here. That's 7.30 on your box down in Melbourne, meaning you'll probably see someone lifting the trophy at around about 10pm. Stephen? After the Cox Plate, it'll be a big day. Thanks to Tim Morgan on the Gold Coast. Melbourne coach Simon Goodwin says he's confident Jack Viney will remain a demon despite free agency interest from rival clubs. The Dees have lost Angus Brayshaw for the season, though, due to a foot injury, while the Giants have dropped their skipper. Simon Goodwin wants Operation Get Ruthless to start this week against the Giants. The best clubs do it. You know, you know what you're going to get from you know, West Coast Eagles when they play, Geelong when they play. But the plan to bring a consistent on-field brand won't include Angus Brayshaw. He's been sent home for his own operation. It's one of those things that the further you investigate, you know, the more significant the injury was and um, he wasn't going to get back at all this year. So the option was then to, to have surgery. The club could also be faced with operation Keep Jack Viney. But despite whispers of interest from the Cats, Goodwin believes Viney's heart beats red and blue true. You know, I think, you know, I think it comes with the territory of being a free agent. You know, if you're another club, of course, you'd be interested. But Jack's a passionate Melbourne man. We love Jack and he loves his footy club. The Giants have gone to extreme measures to snap out of their funk. Captain Steve Cornelio left out in the cold after a patch of lean fall. Yeah, it was a little bit of a shock. Yeah, everyone's certainly on notice. You know, we know we haven't been playing our best football. Um, but yeah, but write us off at your peril, you know, we're really looking forward to the game. While it won't make Cornelio's bitter pill any easier to swallow, he joins an elite crew of omitted captains. John Worsfold watched on as his Eagles played in a final in 98, while all-time great Gary Ayres lost his place back in 93. Toby Green, the man tipped to step up into the role on Saturday night. My gut feel would be that it'd be Toby. Um, you know, I'd happily do it, I'd love to do it, but gut feel is it would be Toby. He's a fantastic leader. Um, he'll really spark the group. De Boer will line up for game 200 on Saturday night. Nick Butler for 10 News First. Alastair Clarkson has warned against the AFL going with more games and shorter quarters in 2021. The master coach says it's the good of the game and not financial gains that needs to win out. Not for the first time this year, Alistair Clarkson has sounded the alarm on the state of footy in 2020. I don't think there's been high-class football being played, particularly by our club, but many of the clubs. In Clarkson's opinion, cramming games was necessary this season, but it's an idea he is wary of moving forward. Says the AFL must carefully consider the impact of playing more games next season for a quick financial hit. For the decision-makers going forward is that the quality of the game needs to be paramount. Um, the money and all that sort of stuff will work itself out and uh, particularly the money will work itself out if it's a high quality product. Luke Beveridge is open to keeping shorter quarters but says more games can't be done with a reduction in club staff. 
if we were to go that way, then that 6.2 soft cap constraint would have to blow out extraordinarily. The Dogs and Hawks meet on Sunday. Eastern Wood won't play in a potential banana peel game for the Bulldogs' finals hopes. I'm sure they'll have something up their sleeve for us. We've got to prepare accordingly and steal our cells. The Blues are yet to give up on their own top eight aspirations, meaning there is no room for sentiment in Bryce Gibbs' farewell match. And I think our fans um, will appreciate what he did uh, for the Carlton Footy Club, but I've got no doubt our fans want him to lose this weekend and, and for, for us to get the job done, and that's what we'll be going out there to do. Tim Morgan for 10 News First. St Kilda is contemplating a selection about face on star midfielder Dan Hanabry. The 29-year-old trained strongly in the AFL's quarantine hub today and is in line for a round 18 recall for the do-or-die battle with GWS for a final spot. He finished off the session with a bit of extra leg work with Jared Roughhead's daughter, Pippa. <laughs> Watching him today and seeing how he's attacked... You know, after, what was it, six or seven weeks ago, that hammy surgery, I think, you know, he didn't look out of shape out here with those two boys who have been going at a fair clip for a while now. A trio of misfits, Hanabry, Ablett and Edwards, finished the session with a team photo, a snap with a difference. Serena Williams is out of the US Open, her hunt for a record equaling 24th Grand Slam on hold. Naomi Osaka is into the final and will face Victoria Azarenka, who finally scored a win against Williams in a major tournament. Since 2008, Victoria Azarenka has been trying. Finally, US Open finals to Serena. As a 31-year-old mum, she feels ready to win one. Well, it's been seven years. That's my favourite number, so I guess that's meant to be. Serena made a blistering start, taking the first set 6-1. She had Azarenka looking within, trying to find composure. The Belarusian says she used to hate tennis. It was a job, but now she's playing for fun. She had Serena on a string. The match level, Serena grabbed at her ankle in the third set. It needed to be re-taped. And from then on, it was only Azarenka firing on all cylinders. Motherhood, divorce and a bit of custody battle behind her, Azarenka will be a humble champion if she wins a third major. I was, I was young, I, my ego was way too big for so now it's a little smaller and the results are coming. <laughs> Naomi Osaka and Jennifer Brady played out a tense three-setter. That is so good. Osaka is the top-earning female athlete on the planet, making 51... Um, being positive and... Not really caring if I win or lose, but just knowing I put in 100% effort. Benz Hamilly for 10 News First. A more relaxing day for Caleb Ewan and the peloton on stage 12 of the tour, giving them a chance to check out some of France's famous elaborate field art. Up front, a breakaway from the breakaway helped Mark Hershey to a breakthrough win. Second on the opening weekend in Nice, third on the second weekend. It is Heroic Hershey who is victorious. No major changes in the overall standings. Tonight the peloton is back in the mountains. The signs were ominous even before tip-off. LeBron was on and so too were the Showtime Lakers as Game 4 of the Western Conference Finals against Houston took centre stage. LA put on a dominant display and although the Rockets made a brief fight back from a 23-point deficit, the King provided the crowning moment of a late fast break. Up ahead, Rondo all the way. LeBron James! Anthony Davis finished with 29 points, the final score 110 to 100. The Lakers one win away from advancing to the Western Conference final. There weren't many in attendance for the NFL season opener due to COVID restrictions, but the boos were still heard during a moment's silence as players linked arms pre-game for a show of unity. On field, the Kansas City Chiefs showed no signs of a championship hangover. Mahomes on the move, throws, caught. Touchdown. The Chiefs in charge to defeat the Houston Texans by 14 points. Their coach lucky to see any of it through his foggy face shield. Big wave surfer Maya Gabera loves taking on walls of water. At Portugal's monster break Nazaré, Maya broke her own world record for the largest wave surfed by a female. Her new benchmark, 22.4 metres, or in the old language, 73 and a half feet Whatever the lingo word is courage. 
my boasting more than enough to surf away with our play of the day. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Well, Mike's back with the weather and we're looking at a wet weekend. Flames all over us. <laughs> what would you then say is a fair criteria for your actions and that of your team to be judged? No. The whole mountain gateway. What sort of runs do you mind? I just knew that I was, you know, I was about to die. Ten News First Person. Available now on Ten Speaks or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Now it's over to Mike for the weather. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Good evening. Two more weathers to go now and also 6.25. And we begin with a magnificent sweeping shot down here at the Brighton Baths on uh, not a bad old Friday night. A lot of people asking, so what happens next week? What happens from Monday? Well, firstly, I'll start losing those corona kilos. And then I've got to help Dan for me surviving the pandemic. Uh, not Dan Andrews, Dan Murphy's. A couple of photos now that have been sent to Mike's Picks at network10.com.au. Uh, remember a kid pointed me out to his dad once and he said, hey, there's Mike's Picks. And because I say a couple of photos that have been sent to Mike's Picks, that kid thought my name was Mike's Picks. Anyway, first up we've got Casper and Glenn Waverley. Very cute. Thank you, Cassandra. And here's a trio of troublemakers. Well, surely not. It's Coda, Jetta and Chili. And thank you to Cara for that particular photo. So it was a sunny start to a grey old afternoon. A little blowy, 11 degrees the overnight low, but 19 this afternoon, so no real complaints there. But we have a lot of rain on the way late tonight into tomorrow, early Sunday. Outside right now, or should I say Friday night in your city, 17 degrees. The humidity of 45%. And why is it warm? We've got a northerly, but currently blowing at 17 kilometres per hour. Around Melbourne today, and most temperatures were close on average, mainly between 19 and 21 degrees this afternoon. Across our state, well... For a, well, to wrap up my working week. Uh, minimums are not at Malakuta. I just wanted to say Malakuta for the last time. Anyway, it was minus two. That was at Mount Hotham. I wish it was at Mount Bulbo, but it was not not. 55 or 25 today's top in Mildura and Walpia, and there was no rain today. Around Australia, over in Perth, 20 degrees. Likewise in Hobart, in between at Adelaide, while 29 degrees. Up in Brisbane, 23, a bit of rain falling there last night. Sydney, 21 degrees. And in Canberra, where a guy at a clock found it time consuming it's for the kids 18 degrees and when I tell a dad's joke it's not that funny I always say for the kids to sort of get away from me uh, the weather charts a cold front and associated low are on the way for a colder and a very wet day tomorrow showers clearing Sunday but not really warming up until mid next week uh, tomorrow the great indoors will be the go the rainfall chart and we love the rain a band from Horsham Ballarat to Melbourne tomorrow will trigger 20 to 40 welcome millimeters of rain so that is great news over to Adelaide for the weekend a soggy Saturday around 20 degrees with 10 mils of rain. Sunday sort of similar. Hobart a wet weekend, 14 degrees and then 16 degrees on Sunday. Up in Brisbane a 23 and 24 degree weekend. Sydney 23 then 22 and in Canberra, who cares? Across our state, rain, glorious rain. Best falls in the Wimmera, the central districts and parts of the southwest. 15 to 40 millimetres of rain. 5 to 15 for most other parts bar the east. Uh, patchy morning fogs in the southwest and the northeast. Shepherd on the top of 20. Uh, Bendigo 17. Ballarat a chilly 9 to 12 degrees. Mind you, up in the Mallee, 28 degrees the maximum. Let's have a look at the radar now. And you can see we've got showers now moving into western parts of Victoria. Uh, the heavier rain, in fact, will be the back of it. Tomorrow, a strong wind warning for Port Phillip. All good, I guess, for well, Kurt's off, quite so far. Around Melbourne, mild tonight. Cooler tomorrow. The rain getting heavier as the day grows older. Frankston, 12 to 16 degrees. In Geelong, 11 to 16. At Mount D, 9 to 11. In the Yarra Valley, 10 to 15. On the bays, northerly winds to 30 knots. They'll turn southerly to 15. Waves about 1.5 metres. The sun rising at 6.24 when I'm sure a lot of you will still be asleep. OK, and now the forecast for our wonderful City by the Bay. Guys, you've got to yell out, City by the Bay! City by the Bay! Now, I actually grabbed that line years ago from an old song called We Built This City. Okay, grey and almost warm this evening. Overnight, we'll hear the pitter-patter of rain. That'll get heavier tomorrow, heavier still in the afternoon. 13 to 16 degrees, 20 to 35 millimetres of rain. Uh, so that's about half the September average in one day. Uh, tomorrow will be an average sort of day. So on to Sunday, early showers, but it will be a sunny afternoon for your hours entertainment or walking. 11 to 17, light southwesterly winds. On to Monday, 10 to 17, partly cloudy. A 20% chance of 
of a shower in eastern suburbs. Uh, the wind turning west southwesterly to 25 knots. On to Tuesday, 8 to 16, partly cloudy. Patchy morning fogs in the northeast suburbs. On to Wednesday, wow, nice, 9 to 23, but it will be a little cloudier. Thursday, it looks like we've got rain returning around 20 degrees. And then Friday, 13 to 21, I'll be back with the forecast in fall at 6.25. Yes, we'll have a special look back at Mike's fabulous 25 years with 10 in just under half an hour. But now developing stories we're following tonight. A Victorian COVID tracing team in Sydney to study why New South Wales does it better. A far from normal festive season with much loved Christmas events cancelled because of COVID. And forgotten and under financial stress, the small businesses hit hardest by our harsh lockdown rules. Police will be out in force across the city this weekend with anti-lockdown protesters set to take their frustration to the streets yet again. Candace Wyatt joins us live now. Candace, the Assistant Commissioner has delivered a strong warning to anyone planning to break lockdown laws. He has indeed, Jen, because just a week after massive protests in Melbourne resulted in 17 arrests and dozens of fines, organisers are at it again. According to Facebook, more than 1,000 people have registered their interest in tomorrow's protest. Now, it's called the Melbourne Walk for Freedom and organisers are promising it will be peaceful, but they're also saying that under no circumstances will it be cancelled. The Premier has called it selfish, but Victoria Police has used stronger language than that. You can expect them to flood the city tomorrow, especially here around the TAN. Today, Assistant Commissioner Luke Cornelius could hardly believe he was back up again to an issuing warnings about yet another mass gathering. To be honest, I feel a bit like a dog returning to eat his own vomit. I mean, it's just none of us would want to do that, and uh, yeah, I'm sick of it, really. Uh, and uh, it goes without saying, yes, it's incredibly frustrating. And if people were less selfish and a bit more grown up, uh, we wouldn't have to keep doing this. So an interesting turn of phrase there from the Assistant Commissioner, but you get the picture and you can almost feel the frustration. Now, Victoria recorded 43 new cases of coronavirus today. That's the lowest daily number in a few days now. And with restrictions due to ease ever so slightly on Monday, authorities will be monitoring those daily case numbers very closely over the weekend. Jen. OK, thank you very much, Candice. Well, despite fears of empty shelves at Christmas, industry groups say there will be no shortage of food come December. But as Annie Kearney reports, the 2020 festive season is shaping as a very different one. It's another sign of just how different Christmas will be this year, with one of our much-loved Melbourne institutions, Myers Burke Street Mall Christmas window display cancelled for the first time in its more than 60 years. It's a really sad day. Obviously, we're going to invest a lot in lots of events uh, over the Christmas period to get people back into the city, but very sad to see that we won't have the My Christmas windows being part of that. Other festive fun has been silenced by the pandemic, with some local councils already making the tough call to move their carols by candlelight online. My five-year-old loves to sing songs, so we'll, we'll sit, still sit there with a candle in our... Uh, house and sing the songs along as they come on. And we know there's always a mad dash to the shops leading up to Christmas, but fears of empty shelves this December have some shoppers on edge. The industry says there'll be no food shortages. We're pretty confident that manufacturing uh, both in Victoria but also elsewhere in Australia will make sure that there's uh, plenty of product on the supermarket shelves. But we might have to go to multiple stores for the products we want. Woolworth says that will happen if restrictions on distribution centres and warehouses aren't lifted. The Premier insists they're still working on it. Annie Kearney there. Well, many small businesses affected by Victoria's lockdown are eligible for little or no government support. And those traders are feeling forgotten. Business owners in partnerships must share a JobKeeper payment and say it's not enough to live on. Landscaper Michael Yusufowicz started gardening work with a school friend a decade ago. The partnership is now a successful business with clients across Melbourne. We've got plenty of work to go back to, but... 
obviously it's illegal for us to do so. During lockdown, the pair have to share one JobKeeper payment per fortnight. Business partners don't qualify for separate payments. So Michael is living on $375 a week, just under half the minimum wage. We're more concerned that if we go down this road again, we have to dig even deeper into savings and being self-employed, those savings are our retirement. If case numbers continue tracking down, gardeners will return to work at the end of the month. They'll be required to work alone. The JobKeeper program will cost an estimated total of $101.3 billion. $39.4 billion is expected to flow into Victoria. Harris Mashoud is a small business owner who won't see any of it. As a co-owner of Nursery Botanica, the sole trader isn't eligible for any state government grants either. It is very frustrating. Frustrating. So far, whatever help that we have received, is, it's actually from our landlords. Some businesses who aren't eligible for any financial support are calling on governments to consider offering them short-term relief on bills or taxes. If you're not willing to provide any sort of assistance in terms of um, aid, um, then maybe perhaps look, look into uh, for small businesses to wipe off their taxes or GST. All retail is set to open in Melbourne in late October if the daily average is less than five new coronavirus cases a day. Emma O'Sullivan for 10 News First. Two fishermen have had a close encounter with a great white shark which chomped on their motor. It has been spotted lingering in waters north of Wollongong after a whale washed up against rocks there yesterday. Surf lifesavers have closed the beaches and have removed the carcass in the hopes the underwater predator will look elsewhere for a meal. Well, Jess Miller is in the traffic chopper. Let's get an update on our roads. Thank you, Jen, and good evening again. We've spotted some crews on scene for a breakdown on the Westgate Bridge, checking it out now in the Carbone Boyers traffic chopper. Not doing too much damage in terms of traffic, just a couple of lanes blocked for the outbound trip. Uh, but out in Baxter, we've had word of a collision on Frankston Flinders Road. That's near the Mornington Peninsula Freeway. Emergency services are on scene, and it is looking quite heavy with uh, traffic through there, so that is definitely the area to avoid for now. Back to you, Jen. OK, thank you, Jess. Stephen's back now with Sport and the Giants have dropped their skipper. They have, Jen. They've run out of patience with Stephen Canelio. Toby Green tipped to be stand-in skipper. We're live to the Gold Coast to preview the Cats v the Tigers. And here's a pick with a difference as a Tiger, a Cat and a Saint prepare for their return. If you've been injured at work, on the road or in a public place, now's the time to act. Carbone Lawyers are open and here to take care of you no matter the situation. Call Carbone Lawyers on 1800 369 888 today. Yes, footy's back on 10 teams on 10. Nick Butler alongside Dylan Buckley. Do we set the agenda? Not quite. Are we hard hitting? Not really. Do we make footy fun? Uh, sometimes. Why is my footy so small? Well, I think I know why. Catch us on 10 play. Richmond's top four hopes hinge on it winning tonight's heavyweight clash against Geelong at Metricon Stadium. Tim Morgan joins us from the Gold Coast. Tim, this is shaping as one of the games of the year. Good evening, Stephen. And any other year, you'd say September's come early. The turn of phrase doesn't quite work in 2020, but we can still say it's a very important game, one that is going to have implications on the final makeup of the top A. The Cats, well, they're still in the hunt for the top two. As you mentioned, for Richmond, they really do need to win out from here to lock up the double chance. And a big part in doing that will be stopping the influence of Tom Hawkins tonight. He's been in career best form. He's leading the Coleman medal and certainly looms as a daunting task for Noah Bolter down back for Richmond. But uh, the Tigers say he won't have that task all alone. We sort of, we're never a 1v1. We don't rely on 1v1s. But in saying that, there's times where you have to compete one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a bit of both, really. Hopefully some system to be able to help and then hopefully Noah can, can do a good job on Hawk himself. So both teams are adamant heading into this one. They won't be leaving any powder dry. This uh, truly will be a uh, full dress rehearsal a couple of weeks out from the final series. 
Yeah, I think you just get a good feel of where you're at um, during the season. We're up against a, a fantastic team tonight, so we'll get a good feel on where we need to improve. And if we, if we think we're a top team, we'll perform tonight and um, hopefully have a real good crack at it. The goal at the end of all of this, of course, is the first ever night grand final at the Gabba. We now have a time for it, 6.30 locally, that's 7.30 on your box in Melbourne. Stephen? It's going to be a long grand final breakfast, thanks to Tim Morgan on the Gold Coast. Demons midfielder Angus Brayshaw will miss the rest of the season due to foot surgery. Fellow on baller Jack Viney has been linked with a move to the Cats, but the coach believes Viney's heart beats red and blue. I think it comes with the territory of being a free agent. You know, if you're another club, of course, you'd be interested. But Jack's a passionate Melbourne man. We love Jack and he loves his footy club. And the Giants have made a huge selection statement, dropping captain Stephen Cornelio. Another milestone for the Misfits today. It was Team Photo Day in the Quarantine Hub. The collegiate approach between the clubs saw Gary Ablett play timekeeper in between drills before dishing out a dose of reality to four-time Premiership Hawk, Jared Roughhead. You get the itch back for five or so minutes and then when you're doing one-on-ones with Gaz, you work out pretty quick that once you're on the other side, it takes a fair bit to get back. Roughhead is bullish about Dan Hanabry's chances and believes the Saint could play in round 18. Cameron Smith has received a ringing endorsement to play on beyond this season. Cowboy... No doubt he can still play. You know, I thought the, the speed of the game might have found him out, but he's just too quick between the ears and he's just... It's the greatest I've ever seen. Smith is in his 18th season of Rugby League. Serena Williams is out of the US Open, losing the so-called Battle of the Mums to Victoria Azarenka. Japan's Naomi Osaka is into the final, beating Jennifer Brady. Serena injured her ankle with the match tied at one set apiece and lost to Azarenka for the first time in a Grand Slam. The Belarusian hasn't been in a major final since 2013. I was, I was young, I, my ego was way too big for, so now it's a little smaller and the results are coming. <laughs> Osaka won only 11 points more than Brady but was superior when the match was on the line. She's looking for her second US Open, having taken the title in 2018. The signs were ominous even before tip-off. LeBron was on and so too were the Showtime Lakers as Game 4 of the Western Conference Finals against Houston took centre stage. LA put on a dominant display and although the Rockets made a brief fight back from a 23-point deficit, the King provided the crowning moment off a late fast break. Up ahead, Rondo all the way. LeBron James! Anthony Davis finished with 29 points, the final score 110 to 100. The Lakers one win away from advancing to the Western Conference final. Australia resumes its rivalry with England tonight, with Nathan Lyon expected to be overlooked for the one-day series opener. The off-spin hasn't played an ODI for more than a year, but says a big goal of his is to play at the 2023 World Cup. Obviously got a taste of a World Cup uh, here last year. Um, unfortunately, we didn't walk away where, where we wanted to get to. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's a big goal of mine to, to be part of that World Cup squad and hopefully a winning World Cup squad in, in, in India. Australia is likely to continue playing spin pair Adam Zampa and Ashton Agar. And that's it from me, Jen. Thank you, Stephen. Mike will be back after the break with a seven-day forecast. you then say is a fair criteria for your actions and that of your team to be judged? The whole mountain gave way. I just knew that's about to die. 10 News First Person. Available now on 10 Speaks or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Now Mike's here with the weather. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Good evening once again. And here it is. After 25 wonderful years, I say good night. Uh, it's been uh, fabulous. We've done all sorts of things all around Melbourne. Uh, and I've got my kids, Adam and Grace, off camera. We'll introduce you to them in a moment. A couple of photos now that have been sent to Mike's Picks, our last ones, in fact. Mike's Picks at network10.com.au. And first, uh, wearing sunnies, looking damn cool. That is Hanzo in Paran, enjoying some time in the backyard. Thank you, Demi. And from Sandy, here's Zoe who I really hope likes getting dressed up. Well, temperature-wise today, 11 degrees was the overnight low, 19 degrees the maximum, so 
both a bit above the average. Uh, a bit of sunshine this morning, some cloud this afternoon, rain later tonight into tomorrow. Friday night in your city, love saying that, 17 degrees. Uh, the humidity about 45% and the wind all day today has been a northerly, currently blowing at 12 kilometres per hour down here at Brighton Beach. Around Melbourne today, having a look at some of those numbers, no complaints yesterday or again today. Most temperatures between 19 and 21 degrees mid-afternoon. Across our state, minus two was the overnight low that occurred up in the Alps and 25 today's top in the Mallee and uh, has been a dry day today. Around this mighty big country of ours today, 20 degrees in both Hobart and Perth, a degree warmer up in Sydney, 23 in Brisbane, a bit of rainfall in there last night, and Adelaide just simply showing off 29 degrees over there today. To Adelaide tomorrow will be a soggy Saturday, around 9 degrees cooler, so 20 degrees with around 10 millimetres of rain. Hobart's in for a wet weekend, not a lot of rain, but it'll be happening 14 and then 16 on Sunday. Up in Brisbane, a 23, 24 degree weekend. Sydney tomorrow, 22, 23 on Sunday. And uh, Canberra, a little bit like it was today. Across our state, we've got some good rains on the way. There'll be well, farmers dancing in the street. We've got the best falls in the Wimmera, the central districts and parts of the southwest. 15 to 40 millimetres of rain. 5 to 15 though for most other parts by the east, a bit less there. Patchy morning fogs in the southwest and the northeast. Getting up to 28 degrees tomorrow up in the northwest of our state. Let's have a look at the radar and we're always happier when we see showers. We've got rain moving across from western Victoria and we've got the heavier rain at the back of that tomorrow afternoon. A strong wind warning tomorrow for the Port Phillip area. Around Melbourne, remaining mild tonight for catching up with one friend, perhaps. Uh, cooler tomorrow, the rain getting heavier as the day grows older. Frankston 12 to 16, Geelong 11 to 16, and of course, remaining within that 5k radius. Uh, on the base tomorrow, northerly winds to 30 knots, that will turn southerly to 15, waves about 1.5 metres. And now the forecast for our city by the bay. <laughs> Yeah, grey and almost warm this evening. Uh, overnight we'll hear some rain. Uh, the rain getting heavier tomorrow afternoon. 20 to 35 mils is likely, so that's about half this month's average in one day, 13 to 16 degrees. On to Sunday, early showers and then a sunny afternoon, 11 to 17. Monday again, 17. Tuesday, 16 degrees. And Wednesday, back into the 20s. Happy about that, 9 to 23 degrees. Still a bit of cloud about, maybe a late shower at night. Thursday, 20 return of some showers and this time next week around 21 degrees so there you have it uh nothing much else to say uh, so i'll throw back to you in the studio jen thank you so much mike and we just want to wish you well after 25 years at channel 10 i have loved your work with all the schools the festivals around melbourne and your give a dog a home it was a classic you there mike i think mike's gone I've got to say that Mike was an unbelievable performer live. I've worked with him for all those 25 years, Jen. Oh, you are listening, Michael, though you might have done a runner. <laughs> uh, Not yet, the champagne's over there, though. <laughs> I've worked with you for the 25 years, mate. You're a great performer yeah. live. You're the best in the business, and I'm really going to miss you, except for one thing, your crappy jokes. <laughs> Am I allowed to say and that on television? And that's the way they will remain. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I want to very quickly, if I may, say thank you to everybody at home for inviting me into your lounge room for the last 25 years and more recently the iPhones. Uh, it's been a pleasure sort of showing off our wonderful city. Things are a bit quiet now, but of course things will pick up next year. So I really do thank you for inviting me into your place. And also I've been able to promote charities, events, big events, small events. And uh, yeah, I'm leaving with some wonderful memories at Channel 10. All class all the way, Mike. And we just want to say thank you for so many wonderful memories. Well, the pleasure's all mine. I'm not sure if I've to say anything anymore, but look, rain is on the way, but I'm thinking if I get to work on Monday, oh, that's why I don't get to work. So even if it's wrong, it doesn't matter now. Remembering it's always a forecast, not a promise. <laughs> Good on you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. It's been The bushfire season as such does kick off today until the end of February. OK, you can put out the fire. Isn't this a romantic setting? Venice on the Yarra. Weather details shortly from Ripley with Ripley, the kids and their teddies. From the Glen Waver Police Academy. From Hampton Beach. Inside State Library Victoria. From South Bank tonight. From Princess Pier. And it's a lovely but windy day on the bay. Time to give a dog a home. For more than 15 years, give a dog a home has been part of Victorians' lives. Every Friday at 5.30. Mike was committed, no matter how big the breed, how small or in between, to making sure they got the best possible homes. On behalf of everyone here at the Lost Dogs Home, Mike, thank you. On behalf of every animal, animals here like Sid, 
Willem is hier. Rain, hail or shine, that's how Melbourne delivers its weather. On behalf of everyone at the Bureau, wishing you all the best for the future. We're really sad to see you go. You've been such a great communicator of our forecasts and warnings. Not just that, you've been a pleasure to talk to every day. Ah, oh, with the family.